This is We Need to Talk with Dr. Darcy Sterling, where I give you the tools and skills you need to love better so you can live better. This feels like a very salient time to have an open conversation about women's health, particularly about our hormones at every stage of life and the extent to which women are often made to feel like complainers or crazy by our medical health care providers, who are often seemingly out of touch with the latest research on reproductive health. I myself have had some recent experiences as a patient of an OBGYN, which was so terrible that I blogged about it, and I will link to that story in the show notes. It's my personal experiences, in addition to those of my clients and the women in my personal life, that drove me to want to speak to today's guest. Dr. Karen Tang is a board-certified gynecologist and an internationally recognized leader in reproductive health and the author of the book, It's Not Hysteria, Everything You Need to Know About Reproductive Health But We're Never Told. And she joins me today to discuss your questions about hormones and how they impact women throughout life. Dr. Karen Tang, thank you so much for joining me. So before we begin, I want to make the disclaimer that we are talking about women's bodies with a medical health care provider. I am not going to qualify each question with, this may be TMI or so sorry to mention the word blood. If you can't tolerate the subject, it's okay to skip this episode. So with that said, I am one of those women who has been blessed hormonally. My periods have always been a non-issue. I'm actually surprised that I never got toxic shock because I bleed so moderately that I'd often forget to change my tampons. Um, And I also did not suffer from PMS. But I am almost 55 years old. And in the last year, predictably, I have unfortunately learned firsthand how powerful and all-encompassing our hormones are. And we'll get into a lot of that later. But I wanted to start by asking you to please explain the role of hormones in the female body. Sure. So, you know, a lot of people hear the word hormones and they're not exactly sure what it means. Um, They're basically just signals. They're signals um, that control the functions of our body. So, for instance, insulin is a hormone or thyroid hormone. Uh, But when we talk about women's health, a lot of people think of the, uh, the sex hormones, the ones released from your ovaries. Those are estrogen, progesterone, and also testosterone. So some people may not realize that women have testosterone too and men have estrogen, uh, but they're not unique to one, you know, sex or the other. So um, they affect a lot of things. And I think, you know, we'll get into this, uh, but, you know, people oftentimes recognize when things go awry with hormones that, uh, you know, when they're uh, off balance, you feel you're having like mood fluctuations, but they're important for just the normal functioning of our bodies. So estrogen, you know, uh, affects everything from vaginal health, um, libido, the health of your bones, your muscles. There's something called progesterone, which is released when you ovulate. So when you release an egg, you have progesterone hormone, and that actually protects your uterus against the stimulating effect of the estrogen, which actually can cause the tissue to grow too much if you didn't have progesterone. And testosterone um, affects things like muscle and also libido. So all of these have their roles and they play a role when you realize it, when you don't. And I think a lot of people recognize it more when things are off and they feel like things have changed. You sort of take for granted when they're working as they should. And then when they're off, you're like, oh, now I can tell. (laughs) 100%. So how do our hormonal changes impact us throughout the month? And by us, I'm talking about women. So normally when we think of a typical menstrual cycle, so in the beginning part, the beginning part is right as you're having your period or just as your period is ending, your estrogen is rising. And that then leads to after you ovulate around the middle of the cycle, you release an egg. If you're not on something to prevent you from ovulating like a birth control, then your progesterone rises. Progesterone is interestingly the one you can sort of feel more. So we think of it as say like the PMS types uh, hormone. So it can cause moodiness, it can cause some bloating, some constipation. And then as your period is approaching again, that progesterone drops. And that drop in progesterone is actually what brings on your period or the menstrual bleeding. So, And then sometimes as you're heading into your period, you go from constipated 
to too loose stool. <laughs> so there's another, uh, something that functions like a hormone called prostaglandin that can make you have loose stools. We call those period poops. So a lot of your listeners probably like nodding furiously, like, oh my gosh, yes. Like I can tell the difference in like my bowel function as I pass ovulation and heading towards my period, having my period, you can see those very clear fluctuations. And then um, the drop in hormones like progesterone can also bring on things like migraines. So people can have uh, migraines with their periods predictably during that time of the drop. You can also have much more severe mood symptoms, and this is pertinent to you, know, you as a therapist, because those ups and downs of the hormones can bring on um, depression, anxiety, uh, moodiness. And then it's really severe forms, what we call premenstrual dysphoric disorder, which is where you have such debilitating depression, anxiety, uh, mood issues that it's affecting your functioning. So that very predictably is in those like two weeks before your period comes and like magic, when things reset again, those symptoms go away. So you can really predictably see some of these patterns in certain people where, you know, how you feel, how your body's reacting is changing during the phases of your cycle. Why are some women barely phased by their periods and others are nearly incapacitated month after month? And that is such a complex question because it's not just about the amount of hormones. So sometimes you'll see on social media, especially people saying that you have, you know, you must have a hormone imbalance or you must need to detox your system because you're experiencing X, Y, and Z. The reality is it's not that people who are having, you know, say really strong PMS symptoms um, are having more or less hormone than somebody who doesn't. See, if you check someone's actual blood levels, it would probably be exactly the same or definitely, you know, within a normal range compared, you know, somebody who is having horrible, horrible symptoms and somebody who feels absolutely nothing. Like you were saying, you're, you know, you're very lucky. You don't have any major period problems. So it's not exactly a matter of level or amount. It's about how it's affecting your body. And that is so individual. So there are certain things uh, we mentioned, you know, PMDD, premenstrual dysphoric disorder, where, you know, nobody exactly knows, but in certain people, just the hormones are affecting them that much more strongly for unknown reasons. I'm going to pause and give a caveat at this moment in that, you know, when I wrote the book, as I'm describing all these conditions, PMDD, PCOS, endometriosis, I, I have to say for pretty much all of them, we don't know where they come from. <laughs> There's just not enough research on women's health and all these gynecologic conditions to actually know, you know, why is it that certain things affect people in a horribly extreme way and, you know, the other people are not affected at all. We just don't know. Like we don't have like a gene, an enzyme, a mutation uh, that we can point to that says, yes, this is why you experience lots of hormonal issues or period problems and this other person doesn't. So that caveat being said, putting a plug out there for more research on all of this. 100%. This is a call for papers, people. Absolutely. Please. Anybody listening who's a researcher, please, 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 we need you. Um, in terms of things like period problems, like bleeding and pain, there are some medical conditions that can cause that. So we mentioned endometriosis. It's incredibly common. At least 10% of women and girls have it. It's a condition that causes really huh. severe pain with periods and can cause heavy bleeding and also a lot of bowel problems and sometimes bladder problems. It's a condition where tissue that looks like the stuff that normally comes out, you know, with period blood, the endometrium that grows inside the cavity of your uterus, grows outside of your uterus and causes all sorts of, you know, pain and bowel problems, bloating, and it can cause things like infertility. Again, we don't know what causes it. We don't have, you know, an actual biological mechanism, but it's extremely common, runs in families. Uh, fibroids, benign tumors of your uterine muscle causes painful and heavy periods. Um, PCOS, a uh, most common endocrine condition among women, can cause problems with ovulation, testosterone levels being high. Again, we don't know what causes it. So there are some things that are physical medical issues that can cause problems with periods, with the cycle irregularity, with pain, with bleeding issues. So is what you're saying that because we haven't done enough research on women's bodies and on women at all different stages of life and the various hormonal issues that they contend with, we don't actually know why some women like me kind of like sail through life <laughs> with no problems. And then we've got my wife and my daughter who are like crippled yep. by their periods, literally yeah. physically ill, vomiting from them. And 
as my daughter likes to say, like every third month, and she's not prone to dramatics, fighting for her life on mm -hmm. the bathroom floor in the fetal position. We don't know. Yeah. No. And I always make this example in my social media. Like, imagine, if you will, that these affected men, <laughs> that, you know, Literally. it would be so debilitating. And, you know, one to two weeks out of every month that you just could not function, you couldn't go to school, you couldn't go to work, um, you know, can cause couldn't play sports. all of these problems. Yeah, can't live your life. And we just wouldn't know. You know, we just don't know. And um, there's not an easy diagnostic test for these things. It's because women's pain and suffering has been so normalized uh, that people say, oh, that's just periods. That's just PMS. That's just menopause. And that dismissive attitude is why there's just not enough research and funding and that leads to misinformation and women and girls suffering for years and years sometimes. I will say if your daughter is having that much pain, there is a strong chance of endometriosis. So um, anyone out there who either you know is young and or has young daughters who are missing school, missing sports, throwing up, having to get called out of class because they're just such bad pain, there's a strong chance of endometriosis. That's the most common cause of that severity of pain. Um, and, you know, I mentioned that there's not an easy diagnostic test for that. Um, it's diagnosed surgically with a laparoscopic surgery. That sort of leads to the delay in diagnosis too, because, you know, nobody wants to jump right to surgery. So people can end up in these cycles of, you know, the gynecologist may try birth control. That's usually the first line, mm -hmm. you know, because that often will make periods less crampy and less heavy. But then, you know, they try one, it doesn't really work, or they have side effects, they try another, they try another, and then they just get caught in the cycle of trying a million birth controls and never really getting relief. So if that sounds familiar to any of your listeners, you know, that is concerning for something else going on, most common being endometriosis. So that's where you would want to, yeah. you know, talk to your doctor, see a gynecologist, get a second opinion if you're not getting answers. So at what point should someone seek out medical advice for painful periods? And is there a specific type of MD we should seek out? Because dealing with a blank stare from a healthcare professional, mm -hmm. it can feel worse than like not reaching out at all. Yeah. And that's been a major issue. So in general, when people say, when should I seek attention for this? I always say if it's affecting your quality of life. So in terms of pain, like pain is so subjective. You know, one person's 10 out of 10 pain is different from somebody else's 10 out of 10 pain. But in general, it all that matters is how it affects you, is that if you are like not able to live the life you want to live for whatever reason, that's enough. That's enough reason to see your doctor. And you don't have to wait until you're just like unable to function. Uh, sometimes people are like, I'm just going to push through until I just like cannot make it anymore. Don't do that. Like don't wait until you literally are just like on the floor and can't function anymore. What happens a lot is that people do see a doctor and they get told, yes, that's just periods. It's nothing to worry about. You're normal. So I always tell people, if you're getting that answer, get a second opinion. Or mm -hmm. if you can't, because you know some people, there may not be a lot of gynecologists where they live or their insurance only covers certain gynecologists. You kind of push them a little bit. So I always tell people it should never be the situation that the doctor's like, you're fine. We're not going to do anything else. End of story. There should always be a what's next. So what testing are we going to do? What can we try? What's the next step? If we tried everything that you have to offer, can you refer me to a specialist? So there should always be, you know, a part two, like the next part of the plan. It should never end with, well, that's just this. I'm sorry. You know, um, if the doctor has reached the end of what they can offer you, they should be offering to help you connect with a specialist who can. So for gynecology, a lot of people don't realize that there are actually specialists within obstetrics and gynecology, that it's not just the OBGYNs that you might see for, you know, your routine exams, pregnancy care. There's actually mm -hmm. some specialists. So my, my own specialty is what's called minimally invasive GYN surgery. So we do the surgical management of things like endometriosis, fibroids, cysts. Um, and because of that, we're also specially trained in pain. So we check things like pelvic floor muscles, nerves, like other, you know, like bowel, bladder problems, things that could be causing pain too. So if you're seeing your regular OBGYN, you're really not getting answers. You know, this is where you start to crowdsource or ask the doctor for a referral to a pain specialist, an endometriosis specialist. And a lot of people on social media with endo, with fibroids and all these issues have kind of like 
formed these groups mm -hmm. for support because they had such a struggle finding a doctor. So they actually maintain doctor lists. Um, like uh, there's a group called Nancy's Nook that maintains like, you know, doctor, endometriosis doctor lists. Mm. And uh, this is for a lot of medical conditions. Like you sometimes will just like seek out these groups that have kind of come together and been like, you know, it was so hard for me to find a doctor. I'm going to try and make right. it easier for the next person. So you can try and find those sort of things. Um, a little aside, there's also for people who say have struggled to get tubal ligation because they're child free or they, you know, are in their 20s. There is a child free Reddit that actually crowdsourced a huge list of gynecologists and urologists winning to do sterilizations if you haven't had a child before. Is so, that, is that yeah. also known as tying your tubes? Yes. Yeah. So that's like the the term we used to, we don't kind of like literally tie them anymore. Like nowadays we just take the whole tube out usually, but mm -hmm. yeah, the expression tying your tubes for sterilization is, is what we're talking about. So it's not just about, you know, medical problems. Sometimes it's just care in general. Sometimes it's hard to find. And so, you know, there are ways to get the care you need if you're reaching that hit a brick wall situation with the gynecologist that you've seen already. So we're looking for a minimally invasive. So if your periods are really debilitating, mm -hmm. and the thing that I don't like about the term really debilitating is mm -hmm. that part of our history as women, and this not being researched enough, is that it has been minimized. We have been told to suck it up. And mm -hmm. so I hate the idea of telling our listeners, hey, if it's debilitating, because People think that even if it's debilitating for them, maybe it shouldn't be because it wouldn't mm -hmm. be for someone else. Mm -hmm. So tell me if this is a good enough encapsulation of what you're saying. And if I'm wrong, please correct me. Oh, it sounds like you're on track. <laughs> if, if, if your period is uncomfortable enough mm -hmm. that the closest people in your life are very aware of how painful, uncomfortable, and often debilitating it can be, even if you're pushing through your normal daily activities, that is a green light for addressing this. Is that right? Yeah, no, that's great. And it doesn't even have to be. Sometimes people are so good at kind of keeping it quiet or keeping it hidden that people may not notice, but you're still like, oh my God, you're like gritting your teeth. You're having to like just kind of take tons of over-the-counter medication just to function. Even if people don't notice, if you know, then that's enough. If it's affecting your functioning, your quality of life, it's keeping you from doing the activities that you want to do, like exercising, working, having sex, like anything like that, that's plenty. That's more than enough. So you don't have to wait until you are totally debilitated because, you know, about that point, like we don't say that about any other thing. Like we don't tell you like you can't see someone about your back pain until you're like absolutely debilitated, you know. Right. Um, it shouldn't be that way for women's health either. So if you know that your period coming on, like the minute you feel that first cramp, you have to hit Advil and Tylenol or mm -hmm. you have to over your dose of the normal recommendation of either of those drugs or mm -hmm. you're going to be doubled over in pain. That's an indication Absolutely. that you should have a conversation first with your OBGYN. And if that feels like a brick wall that you've just hit, then you need to ask or look around for a specialist in what exactly? Minimally invasive surgery? Is that what we're looking for? Yeah. And like they, they come in different terms. So, you know, endometriosis specialists, minimally invasive surgeon. So they're kind of like interchangeable terms. Uh, some minimally invasive surgeons are more focused on other things like fibroids. But in general, you know, that's the specialty that tends to focus on endometriosis. And another indication that something could be going on is you're planning your life around your periods. And people say this all the time. Oh, my gosh, I can't go on this trip. I can't do this thing or plan an event because I know I'm going to be so caught up in the pain, the bleeding. I'm going to be worried about soaking through my clothes. So if you are having to plan your whole life around the week or so that you're having your period, that's definitely indication you should go to see a specialist, to see your doctor. That's so helpful. Thank you for that. Yeah. So let's talk about menopause because no one fucking does. No. And if you're listening <laughs> to this and you're not in menopause, hang in there because one day you will be. <laughs> and also, I've got a lightning round of questions for Dr. Tang coming up where she's going to answer questions from young adults in their 20s and 30s, and you really don't want to miss that. But back to me. <laughs> so I am in perimenopause, and let me tell you how I figured that out a year ago. It is not by skipping periods because that hadn't happened yet. I started gaining weight. My sleep, which has been epic my entire life, I came out of the womb sleeping 10 hours a night, <laughs> and that has not changed 
Even since college, I have always been an Olympic sleeper, and my sleep suddenly became very, very inconsistent. I was suffering enormously from brain fog, which is not great for someone who makes a living flexing her brain like a mm -hmm. bicep. Mm -hmm. um, and I had a sudden level of moodiness that made me truly consider I'm not being hyperbolic here, building a padded room in my house. My moods did not swing weekly or daily. They swung by the hour. Mm -hmm. I cycled between levels of sensitivity that made me cry more times in a day that I could count mm -hmm. and levels of rage that make me marvel today that I still have, that my relationships are basically still intact. And it was interesting, like the dork, scientist in me was interested in it because I did get to test out my own emotional management tools mm -hmm. and they do work, but the amount of energy it took to barely keep my shit together <laughs> makes me hate the doctors who delayed medicating me. Mm -hmm. Speaking of which, so my primary caregiver was, and I'm sharing this because I think this is so common. I know it's common because I hear eight different sets of stories every day five days a week. So I hear enough stories from enough diverse clients that I know this is very common. So my primary caregiver was convinced that hormone replacement therapy would give me cancer, even though I have no family history of cancer. And that led me on a quest to find an MD who would prescribe it, which was not a one-stop shopping situation for me. Um, the person who initially prescribed it to me kept me on the loading dose, which is the first dose they give someone for nine months because oh she was worried. She was worried that increasing my dosage would cause me to gain more weight. Oh, and at a certain point, I decided, you know, my sanity worth a few extra pounds. <laughs> so I am now happy to report that I am at a therapeutic dose feeling quite sane. The difference has been night and day. Oh, I'm only sure. at my next entry level. I'm literally just at a clinical appropriate therapeutic dose mm -hmm. for HRT. Um, here come my menopause questions. Mm -hmm. Why are doctors so hesitant to prescribe hormone replacement therapy, which I will now refer to as HRT? And this is where we get into the storytelling of all this. So when I was just starting my medical school training in OBGYN, it was literally the year 2002 when this major, major study called the Women's Health Initiative came out, WH. Right? Before then, we were actually, you know, we being the medical field, uh, giving HRT pretty liberally, like almost to like everyone indefinitely. We were giving it to prevent osteoporosis or thinning bones, uh, to keep people young. And then this huge study came out. It was like the biggest study of HRT to, to date. It was massive. And it showed that there was an increased risk of things like heart disease, breast cancer, and every it was like the screeching record sound effect, like screech, like, you know, people slam to a halt. The entire mind shift like that took place because of that one study was unbelievable. So for 20 years, basically, the thought process was that somebody would have to be, and we mentioned the debilitating concept, totally debilitated before they should get hormones. You would try literally everything under the sun until you know, reach the point where the person was like, please, I'm desperate. I'm begging you. I, I tried everything. It doesn't work. I need the hormones. Then you would be like, okay, like let's try a brief course of hormones. So this is truly like the entire beginning part of my career was in this sort of environment. And then in recent years, People reanalyzed that data. They took another look at it. They broke it down and looked at it in more detail. And they discovered that back then, again, we were giving HRT forever. So people mm -hmm. in that study were much older in general than the people who are typically taking HRT nowadays. The symptoms of menopause, like the hot flashes, night sweats, moodiness, those sort of things are worse around the years you're going through perimenopause. It tends to get better over time, those type of symptoms. So it's not usually that someone in their 70s, 80s, 90s is having those hot flashes, night sweats, like they did when they were in their 40s and 50s. So back then, the people in the study were on average much older, and older women have a higher risk of heart disease and breast cancer. So when they broke it down and saw that when you looked at women in your age group, my age group, 40s, 50s, that there was very minimal risk of the heart disease, the breast cancer, et cetera. The actual increase was incredibly small. And Do you know the stat off the top of your head? 
the breast cancer risk is like one in like 1,000, like, you know, per years or something like that of use. So it is a very small amount. And I actually, I'll give credit to my friend, Dr. Jen Gunter, for this analogy. She said that there is some side effect of Viagra that has a similar scale of, you know, like a incidence compared to the breast cancer increase risk with HRT? We never hear about no that. No one knows about Viagra risks. Have you ever heard anybody talk about Viagra risks? Not a one. Nobody cares. They're just like, oh, you know, Viagra is important. You should take it. No one's like, oh, but, you know, be careful about that side effect. I have never heard a single word about that. But women's health, you say the word breast cancer. And again, it's like the screeching record sound of like, oh, my God, like breast cancer, even if the risk is extremely small. And, you know, obviously people don't want to take undue risk with breast cancer, but For sure. just the the example that women's quality of life is thought to be so much less important that we would make someone truly suffer and not be able to go to work, sleep, function, live their life because we're so focused on that tiny risk compared to the benefit of the quality of life. So in general, when we talk about medications, any sort of medical intervention, we have to look at the balance of the benefits versus the risk, not just the risk. And we shouldn't like blow up the concept of the risk to the point that we can't even see the benefit. And that's, that's what happens. so important. That feels yeah. so valid to me. Yeah. yeah. We don't analyze, well, how do you quantify the mm -hmm. benefits? Benefit well, I guess you living could. Living well. <laughs> yeah. You could. You could. Yeah. I can th I can think my way through a measurement tool for that. Right. Exactly. You absolutely yeah. can. It's not that mm -hmm. hard. Right. Exactly. The other thing that came out of that study um, that people realized was they weren't looking at every single type of HRT either. They were looking at very specific formulations, like a type of pill that had estrogen progesterone in a type of pill that had estrogen. Um, they weren't looking at patches, which are less risk. So there's less mm -hmm. blood clot risk, very minimal blood clot risk with patches. They weren't looking at vaginal estrogen, which has basically no risk. But people then extrapolated these concepts to every single type of HRT, no matter what. They're just like, oh, it's going to give you breast cancer. I'm like, no, it's not. <laughs> like, yeah. Now we know that um, estrogen alone, actually in that study, showed a decreased risk of breast cancer. People with a, uh, a uterus, like I said, have to use estrogen and progesterone because, mm -hmm. you know, if you just do estrogen alone, it can increase uterine cancer risk. But say someone's had a hysterectomy or if you're using an estrogen patch and a different type of progesterone, you may not have the same breast cancer risk at all. So, again, it was all kind of extrapolated to this big hysterical level where people became very scared of HRT in all formulations. And now we know more about the risks, you know, for younger women, especially much less than we thought. Um, the quality of life is so important. And then also things like the vaginal estrogen, which is hugely effective for preventing like the pain with sex, bladder urgency, all these super bothersome symptoms and basically no risk. And so, you know, now experts in menopause are like, yeah, we can have this conversation. We can offer these things. We should offer these things to people who are having classic symptoms. And also important in what you were saying about what exactly you were feeling, sometimes people think that menopause symptoms is only hot flashes and sweats. Like that's the one you say, quick, give me symptoms of menopause. I'll say hot flashes and sweats. There are so many more symptoms and, and people may not even recognize that those are perimenopause symptoms. The brain fog, the sleep issues, joint pains. Like people oh my have God. like musculoskeletal joint pains. They'll be like, what is going on? Did I hurt myself? So again, you know, typically people don't associate that with menopause, but it is a thing. Weight gain, like weight gain in your abdomen area, you know, like uh, central adipose uh, metabolism. So all of these things can be perimenopause, menopause symptoms too. And that's important to, to discuss because again, like this old fashioned way of thinking was it's only hot flashes and night sweats. I've heard people say that their doctor told them it couldn't be perimenopause because they were still having periods. And that's not true. You can have regular periods and be perimenopausal. So mm -hmm. again, there's a lot of these like myths and old fashioned ways of thinking about things that still persist. And in fact, I recall that, and this might have been me projecting my own concerns onto my primary care physician's face as I reported these symptoms to him because he knew that I've been going through this. I see him every single month because I have ADHD and you have to see your doctor every month mm -hmm. to get those prescriptions. And every month I'd be, he'd be like, so how, how's the moodiness? And I, I would sometimes just start crying, just describing it to him. Mm -hmm. And I got the sense that like, he would conflate my concerns about weight gain. It, the moodiness, 
the emotional liability, like I felt so out of control. I literally was like, okay, I have my facility already picked out for my first nervous breakdown, which I had picked out for years. (laughs) And I was like, is it time? Am I really at a place where I need to? But the look on his face, it felt to me like he felt like my gripe was one of primarily being about my weight and the way I looked Mm -hmm. like that was a superficial problem Mm -hmm. and that I just needed to get past that. And it was so invalidating. And it got to the point where like he would subsequent months ask about it. I'd be like, what's the point? We're not going to change anything. Let's not stir the pot if you're not prepared to be part of the solution. And I Mm -hmm. swear I said it just like that. Mm -hmm. All right. What are the hormones in the category of HRT? So they're actually the ones that we just mentioned in the context of normal cycles and periods. So estrogen, so progesterone, estrogen mm-hmm. progesterone, and, and testosterone. And testosterone. Yeah. Yeah. So estrogen is the main one. So when we think about improving all of the symptoms of perimenopause, menopause, usually we're talking about the estrogen. The progesterone does help as well, but it's mostly there just so that the estrogen does not cause its own problems. So like I said, if you give estrogen just on its own, it can overstimulate the cells inside the uterus and that can actually cause uterine cancer. So most of the time, progesterone is there just as a safety feature. Um, It is actually effective a little bit for things like hot flashes and night sweats, not to the, the degree that estrogen is. Testosterone for postmenopausal women uh, comes in more in the discussion about libido because decreased libido and arousal is very, very common for people with perimenopause, menopause. And there's not a lot of amazing treatments for that, unfortunately. Again, I'm going to point to the whole misogyny of the system thing. Where, mm-hmm. You know, there's like a million treatments for erectile dysfunction, but there's really very few for decreased libido for women. And women's sexual function is obviously so much more complex than just like achieving an erection is. So you know, all the different existing medications for decreased libido in women are, there's some limitations to them in terms of convenience factor side effects. But testosterone has been shown in postmenopausal women to be really effective for increasing libido. So it's used off-label, meaning that there's not an FDA-approved version of it, uh, mm-hmm. but we'll use it, like a lot of us will use actually like the male dosing of um, testosterone, but just a tiny amount. Uh, use like a, a topical gel usually. You put like just like a much smaller amount amount on than a male dose would would be. So uh, that's the role for testosterone. Like it hasn't actually been shown in studies to be super beneficial for things like the muscle mass. I, I know some people. Oh, it will, hasn't because that was my that was that definitely my no. I know. I, I I've had a lot of people say that they have improvement with it, um, but unfortunately, because of just like you know existing studies, like we just don't have enough proof that it really is helpful for that to say we're going to prescribe it just for that reason. So we we typically prescribe it for the indication of libido, but I have had patients who said, oh, actually, you know what? I did see, you know, proven in like the muscle mass and things like that. Just we call it empirically, like that's their experience. And so. Well, um, I mean, I can go beyond empirical. Uh, I mean, I can I can literally do the empirical piece to it because I've had a DEXA scan uh, and I'm not on the testosterone piece to it. My new provider out of Columbia I'm mm-hmm. so grateful for her. That's She's like, mother, I will yay. be. She was like, me too. I went yay. there for my master's. Oh, amazing. Um, I love it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Look at that. Both of us with the degrees behind us. <laughs> I know. Um, I you put the Columbia degrees. I love it. It's great. My provider was like totally hat. She was like, you're not even on a therapeutic dose of mm-hmm. your estradiol is the mm-hmm. patch that I'm on. Mm-hmm. And she's like, how aggressive do you want to be? I said, well, I'm a scientist. I want to be very, very not aggressive. I want to do one step at a time and mm-hmm. I want to measure it over time. And I want to be on the lowest dose of everything that I can possibly be on. But she's down to give me testosterone. And I've already had the DEXA scan just mm-hmm. on the, before I was actually on the appropriate dose of the estradiol. Um, So I would be able to repeat that conceivably in like three months. And if it does increase muscle mass, because I work out like a nut, Mm -hmm. um, I should be able to see that in a few months. No. Well, so the DEXA is just for the bone density. So they wouldn't actually No, it also does. No, it does. It it measures. I had it done and it measured my muscle mass, my skeletal mass. Yeah, I didn't just have it done for 
that reason. I had it done because everybody was telling me that the weight gain was that I was gaining muscle. But I grew up as a gym rat in New Jersey, and I know how hard it is to actually build muscle. And I said, there's no effing way that my weight gain is because I'm working out this much. So I had a DEXA scan, and that confirmed everything that I suspected. I'm like, I'm not afraid of doing the tests. I'll do the tests. Mm -hmm. If I'm crazy, that's easier to deal with, frankly. Mm -hmm. I know what to do for that. Mm-hmm. I can use my tools for that. I was about to say, you're you know like what I'm an saying? Expert. Like yeah. I, I'm like literally yeah. the right person to have yeah. a mental health crisis because I know what works and what doesn't work, and mm-hmm. I know the avenues. Mm-hmm. So I did the DEXA scan, and it confirmed that I have a good amount of muscle mass, but like mm-hmm. there's also a good amount of there was at least a good amount of fat on me. Mm-hmm. So if I were to then do use testosterone for a a couple of months, conceivably, I should be able to then repeat that and see a change in the muscle mass. Presumably. I mean, I only know the DEXA in the context of bone density, but if it has Mm -hmm. a a report on, you know, like fat and, you know, like muscle mass and things, you should be able to like, you know, quantify it. And there are other ways too, you know, that you could do these studies. Like it's obviously, you know, these studies are possible. Like, it's so funny that we're like, just who will even ever know? (laughs) I'm like, there are ways to do these studies. It's just that people aren't doing them. And, you know, I think it's super important because as like half of the human population is going to go through this experience. More than half. That's the craziest thing about all this is it's not just like a niche subject. This is not like, oh, maybe some women are going to be affected by this. No, it's like literally, like you said, just slightly more than half of the human population is going to go through these body changes. And it's outrageous that we just don't know. Are we like, you know, we have very limited data, you know, that look at things like metabolism, you know, like fat metabolism, bone impact, like all these things is just so ridiculous. Um, They're starting to do a little bit more, I think, because, you know, I hate to say this, but like that women in our generation now have power. We have a voice Mm -hmm. and we can say this is crazy. That's right. I'm not accepting it. No. And you see the the Oprah's, the Halle Berry's, you know, like the Naomi Watts who are like, this is effed. Like, we are at the top of our professions. Mm -hmm. You know, we are so successful. And when you mentioned like the not being able to function and feeling like you're going crazy, like, wasn't it like Oprah was like, oh my God, I thought I was having heart attacks. I couldn't read. She has like her Oprah book. She was like, I can't focus to read. And this is like my job. And so it it becomes so debilitating, all of these issues. And it is really just unacceptable that we up until now and continuing through now that we treat women this way that we say, oh, you just have to just tolerate it, just push Mm -hmm. through. Um, You hear a lot of like, well, every woman has gone through this and they made it through somehow. I'm like, well, that's not a good reason to make people. That's right. And and (laughs) that is the look in my primary care physician's eyes. When I would answer direct questions about this, the Mm -hmm. look was everyone has I swear I felt everyone has lived through this. You're not unique. You're going to get through it. And I'm like, no, but this is unacceptable. This is absolutely unacceptable. Last question about Mm -hmm. testosterone. Mm -hmm. So if I have been lasered, am I going to grow a beard if I add that to my hormone replacement therapy? Hopefully no. So when we do testosterone therapy, we actually do measure testosterone levels. Um, most other HRT, we don't because, you know, the FDA approved versions, we know kind of how they affect the levels in your bloodstream. Testosterone, again, because there's not an FDA approved version for women, we have to be a little bit more careful about potential side effects like the hair growth, acne, in extreme cases, really bad, like, you know, balding. Like that's So a, hair growth in the wrong areas and of there, your body. And less and hair then- <laughs> Okay. And lost another. So it's really important yeah. to be careful about that. Yeah. Uh, that's that's one of the few say. things. Yep. That's one of the few things that we actually do monitor your hormone levels to make sure we're not overshooting. For things mm-hmm. like estrogen and progesterone, um, as long as you feel okay, we t- we base the dosing on how you feel. So are you getting enough of an improvement in your symptoms? Are you feeling okay on this dose? That's all we need to know. We don't need to keep on testing your blood because it's just going to show, you know, probably a quote unquote normal amount. We only really kind of care about how it's affecting you and how you feel. But testosterone, because we don't want to overshoot and cause those like male, you know, masculinization symptoms, we do periodically check the blood work to make sure. And obviously, if you are experiencing things like, you know, facial hair growth and stuff like that, then we say, oh, maybe dial it back, use it less frequently and things like that. What is the off-ramp to HRT? Do we take them for life? And if we come off them, won't we then experience the withdrawal symptoms that led us to take them in the first place? 
And that's a great question. So like I said, it used to be that people just kind of stayed on it indefinitely. Now we know, and again, they've broken down the data, looking at the different age groups, and it's come to be acknowledged that, say, women over age 60 or more than 10 years out from menopause have you know a little bit less of that benefit, and you start to get those risks of the cardiovascular disease, the breast cancer risk goes up. So those guideposts are usually when we start to say, you know, how are you doing? Is this something that we want to wean you off of it eventually? Um, you know, it is very rare to have somebody who's still on what we call systemic HRT, meaning not the vaginal version, uh, the version that goes throughout your bloodstream and the rest of your body until they're in their 70s, 80s, 90s. Like that's definitely less common nowadays. So in general, it's not like an either or. It, it used to be very cut and dry, like, oh my gosh, you reached this point and we got to take you off. It's not like that. So we always have a conversation with the person, like, how are you feeling? Do you want to try? What are your thoughts? And if somebody is, you know, I acknowledge the risks, I'm feeling great with this, I'd really rather not stop it. You know, you could just monitor, make sure your cholesterol is good, you're getting all your other tests to make sure your heart's healthy, getting your mammograms. So it's a conversation between the person and their doctor about what they want to do. In general, when you stop HRT, you were mentioning withdrawal, we do gradually wean them off. We don't stop cold turkey because you can get a withdrawal, you know, kind of like bounce back phenomenon if you just stop cold mm -hmm. turkey. So we do just like gradually decrease the dose. We space out the dosing so that your body kind of like off ramps. That's actually a great analogy. It's kind of gradually off ramps. The vaginal estrogen, you can keep forever. Again, we're, we're thinking huh. about risks and things. The vaginal symptoms and the bladder symptoms, it's not just the vagina, of menopause, that does continue and that can get worse over time. So like I said, hot flashes, night sweats don't last forever. The vaginal and bladder symptoms, what we call genitourinary syndrome of menopause or GSM, that can continue forever and can get worse over time. What's and the bladder symptom? Oh, you can get like bladder urgency. You have to pee all the time. You have to get up in the night to pee or you can get recurrent UTIs. You can get more oh actual infections because the tissue gets so delicate that bacteria can get in. So you get people who are like, oh my God, I'm like peeing all the time and it hurts. And I do actually have a UTI. So vaginal estrogen actually prevents UTIs. It decreases Ooh. bladder urgency. It can help strengthen the pelvic floor. So it has all these benefits. And like I said, basically no risk. We've actually even seen that among many breast cancer patients that they can take vaginal estrogen safely. There are some exceptions. You still have to obviously talk with your oncologist, but most breast cancer patients can actually use vaginal estrogen because almost none of it goes into your body. Huh. A lot of breast cancer patients actually went through early menopause because the chemo, the treatments, the anti-estrogens, like threw them into super early menopause. So sometimes those are the women who suffered the most yep. early, long, horrible menopause. And they were just like dying because they were like, oh my God, I can't you know, do anything because it's going to give me cancer again. You know, I've had patients in their twenties gone into yes. medical menopause and yes. And and had had to fight for their hormone replacement therapy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, yeah, vaginal estrogen, now we know many or most oncologists will now allow breast cancer patients to use safely. Again, there's some exceptions to that, but the majority can. And again, it was just for years and years, it was just like, no, 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 it's too dangerous. Like, no, no, no. And people are like, oh my gosh, like, you know, I survived breast cancer, but I'm so miserable. Like, uh, right. and now there are some other non-estrogen treatments for the hot flashes and things. So yeah, uh, I quite recently a few invested in one yeah. of those stocks. It went public. Oh, is it? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So sure we uh, did. It's not know. doing well enough. So people need to buy it. <laughs> <laughs> they have because like nobody's talking on the about it. Super no one yeah. talks about it. No. All of our doc, like my own mm -hmm. primary care physician, like there was a non-hormonal solution. Mm -hmm. I didn't really suffer from hot flashes. I think I had like four my whole mm -hmm. life. And they happened very rapidly, but I was also on the precipice of starting the HRT and mm -hmm. then they went away right away. But like he didn't even suggest oh, non-hormonal no. remedies oh, for hot gosh. flashes. Like I don't understand. 
Yeah. All right. And Let's... yeah, we focused on HRT, but just to quickly say that there are other non-hormone options like Vioza, which is the treatment we mentioned, which is a brand new one. You know, some SSRI antidepressants like Paxil actually, you know, actually several of them, not just Paxil, uh, help with hot flashes, gabapentin. So somebody who has breast cancer who maybe can't take systemic HRT right. has options too. It shouldn't be that they're just like, oh, he's got you know nothing for you. I'm sorry. You know, your doctor should be talking about all of your options. Now, literally the first OBGYN that I went to for these symptoms suggested that I go back on an antidepressant, which I just come off of. Mm -hmm. um, I had been on an SNRI for ages, had been meaning to come off of it, but then there was a pandemic and a global mental oh. health crisis. <laughs> Didn't yeah. seem like the right time Not the to right come, time. Off of my, <laughs> come off of my anti-anxiety medication when I'm holding space for double the amount of clients. So a year and a half ago, I was like, we're, we're titrating off this. We're going to start in February. I'm going to be done by June. We're going to go real slow because I'd been on it for like 10 years and I wanted to come off of it. And her first response was, well, how about an antidepressant? And I was like, I just came off of an antidepressant. I am not going back on. And, and also like, because back to the name of the book, why are you hysteria. treating me like I'm fucking crazy? Mm -hmm. what, be, this is not an emotional problem. This right. is a hormonal problem. Why would you mask the symptoms rather than get to the root of the problem? Yeah. All right, let's put a pin in menopause and my medical annoyances and float back in time a few decades because I have questions for you from my young adult clients and my young adult family members, and we're going to make this a lightning round. All right. How much period bleeding is too much bleeding? Number one, if it's affecting your quality of life, you're building your life around it, that's too much. A little bit more detailed is if you are soaking a pad or tampon in less than an hour, if you're soaking through a tampon onto your clothes or onto a pad, that is too much. And for people using menstrual cups, if you're emptying it more than say like two, three times a day, that's way too much. The one time is supposed to last you like basically the entire work day. Here's an ancillary question to that. Um, what do you think about people who do not bleed during their periods, like barely bleed? Is that okay? If they're on a birth control, that's okay, because the birth control methods that are hormonal usually have or almost always have a progesterone in them, which can decrease the bleeding or take it away totally. So it's okay. I'm not talking if, about that. Uh, I'm talking about you're... someone not on contraception. Just by yourself, that is something to see a doctor for, because if you're either skipping periods, that could be assigned to something like PCOS or- you No, have, feeling yeah. period cramps, yeah. feeling mm -hmm. a period, mm -hmm. but not even needing a tampon. Most yeah, that's what I'm saying is that like if you're not actually having a period, that could be a sign of like an endocrine issue or something like that. So no so way to know- cramping without bleeding yeah. is considered mm -hmm. not having a period? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, the period itself is the the bleeding part. So if you feel like you're like experiencing everything else but not the bleeding, there you know is something else going on. So you know definitely see your doctor if you're not actually bleeding, or if you're bleeding like barely anything, like little spots, not a full flow. You know, see your doctor. And it, like I said, that's the exception is if you are on a birth control that takes away your period, that doesn't count. Got it. Can birth control cause long-term hormonal imbalances? And are there any studies on this we can link to in the show notes? I'm not going to brag, but this one came from one of my kids. <laughs> so no, and this is a myth. And the reason the myth exists, just as an aside, is because if someone is on birth control for many years, their fertility is lower just because of age, the passage of time. So, you know, your fertility when you're 18 is, you know, better than when you are 48. If you take birth control mm -hmm. from 18 18 to 48 and you come off and you're like, oh, I'm having difficulty getting pregnant. It's not the birth control. It's just time passing. So it kind of got this misinformation around it that, oh, if you're on birth control a long time, it's going to make you infertile or it's going to affect your ovary function. It doesn't. There's actually, you know, like there's no data. It's been studied for decades and decades to show that there's any long-term impact. And that's why, you, you know, you have to take a pill every day because it wears off in like a day. You can get pregnant immediately if you miss one pill. So there's never been any long-term data to show that there's any like major impact that lasts on your health. So in general, it's a myth. Don't be scared. And if you listen to any fertility specialists on TikTok, on social media, they'll tell you the same because it's a very pervasive myth. If they're actually an expert and qualified to speak on the subject. Exactly. Okay. 
Why are we hearing more about PCOS? Is it becoming more prevalent due to testing and diagnostics, or are there other reasons such as lifestyle, environment, and medication that are causing more women to have PCOS? So the actual rate hasn't changed. It's actually super common. It's about 10% at least of women and girls who have it. It's the most common endocrine condition, but it may be just more that people are hearing about it because you know, you didn't talk about it very much. And this is for so many of these things. Um, PMDD, for instance, like, you know, very few people ever talk about PMDD, but a lot of people have it. And that, that goes to some of the shame, the stigma around period problems, fertility problems. You know, people felt so embarrassed, you know, talking about this sort of thing. So from the medical perspective, the rates haven't changed, but it is something that people are more verbal about, they're more comfortable discussing. So that might make it seem like it's more visible. And it is associated, I just as an aside too, that it is very highly associated with insulin resistance and diabetes. And this is even if you are slim, it's not associated with your being overweight or obese necessarily. People can have PCOS who are slim and have diabetes as well. And so it's a metabolic condition. I will say that what has changed with PCOS recently is how we think about it. It's not just that, oh, you know, you're overweight, so you cause the PCOS. We now know that it has these metabolic changes that can cause you to gain weight, can make it difficult to lose weight that is associated with having high insulin levels. And so it is, I think, changing in how much we understand it and the way we think about it, not necessarily the number of people who have it per se. Got it. Do you think the quality of our food could be causing hormone imbalances that women are facing? And this is a good question. Uh, not that I know, but in general, highly processed or ultra processed foods can impact health for sure. Whether it's affecting us hormonally, I can't say. What actually we are looking more closely at that is affecting our hormones are what we call endocrine disruptors, which are different types of chemicals, things like, you know, like you've heard of BPA and phthalates that are, you know, in things like bottles. Phthalates are actually in things like hair straighteners, chemical hair straighteners that actually act like hormones in your body. So they've been associated with things like fertility issues, with um, risk of breast cancer, uterine cancer, fibroids. So that is definitely something that we are learning more about and that uh, we have to be really careful about when we're looking at what we're putting into our bodies, you know, not just in what we eat or in the containers that we're using, but also in things like what we're doing with our hair, like the different exposures that we get in our day-to-day -day lives. Oh, gosh. I have a keratin treatment enough. schedule for two weeks <laughs> from now. Don't worry about that. It's fine. <laughs> it's just another thing on my list of anxieties. <laughs> okay. What's the most accurate way to test hormone levels? So the thing to know about hormone levels is that they change day to day and at different phases of your cycle. So when we're testing for hormones, we have to think about, you know, what is the reason that we're testing for them? And where are you in your cycle so that we can actually assess, you know, is this level normal, quote unquote, is it abnormal? If you just get a random blood test, you know, it's hard to say, is this a normal level? Is it not? And that's also part of the reason that for certain things, we don't necessarily check hormone levels because they fluctuate so much that it could be different in the morning and the evening or, you know, from one day to the next day. So for things like fertility testing, so if somebody's having difficulty getting pregnant, which is one of the more common reasons to test your hormones, we standardize the testing to, we say day three, like, you know, around day three, four, mm -hmm. day one is the first day of normal flow of your period. And then we standardize it to like that day three. And that's just so that we have a good way to compare your levels to everybody else, you know, at your age. And for some people, if you don't have a period, like you have PCOS, it's a very unpredictable. We might get a random level just whenever we can, but it is a little bit harder to interpret that. What are some of your go-to protocols for hormone imbalances and do supplements work? So it depends on what the thing that are that we're talking about. So for premenopausal women, you know, if young you have, adults, this, yeah. is, this is a question from young adult. Yeah. So not everybody has a hormone imbalance. So this is something that, again, is, is a little bit more of like a social media thing than it is a medical condition. In general, it's pretty rare for somebody, if you're having regular cycles, like you're having a predictable period every month and, you know, you're not like skipping a bunch of periods or having really unpredictable cycles, you'll see some 
social media influencers and stuff talking about like you have to balance your hormones, you have a hormone imbalance. You know, in general, you you probably don't. Again, if you were to check your hormones, they almost certainly would be like completely normal, quote unquote. So for someone with something like PCOS or their other uh, hormone, actually true hormone imbalances, it would depend on what the condition was. So for instance, with PCOS, which is again, that's the most common one. So I'll just use that example. Very often they don't have enough progesterone. So they don't release an egg regularly, then you don't get the progesterone, you would miss your period. And then when you finally get your period, you have like, you know, two, three, four months worth of periods all at the same time. So they bleed like crazy. So for those patients, we would sometimes give progesterone in the form of a birth control or a progesterone tablet, or there are different medications like treatments for diabetes, metformin, the GLP-1 medications uh, mm -hmm. that actually do sometimes help to regulate the hormone imbalance because it's so closely tied to insulin resistance and diabetes. So again, it all depends on what the actual condition is and how we manage it. So this is where I tell people, be very careful. If you see someone on social media promising to fix all of your medical issues, you know, like you take their supplement, you take their protocol, you do their course, and they're going to fix you, run away because uh, everything in medicine is personalized. It's all based on the individual person. It's not that I can take one pill and give it to every single human being and fix all of their problems. That's just not possible. So in real life, we have to kind of standardize it to that person. So in general, if someone's like, everybody should do my one thing, it's going to detox your body and fix your whole life that almost certainly is too good to be true and just run away. Yeah. I have to applaud your ability to address those scenarios on social media with it's a hard. level of respect, <laughs> the way that you do it, because it makes me want to gouge my eyes out of my head oh my God. when I yeah. hear these stories, which oh, I terrible. do every day from my mm -hmm. clients. I yeah. spend 20% of my practice debunking myths from horrible. people who are influencers and have no training or credentials to be speaking on the subjects that they're Not speaking to. Oh, no. It, it's, all you have it's to do is exhausting. put in your profile hormone expert. And they don't say what their background is, what they're not like, what they're basing that expertise on. They're just like, I'm a hormone expert. And then they also just like sell the most complete nonsense bullshit. And they'll mm -hmm. charge people so much money. I've yes, had patients, they will. I'm sure you've had thousands of dollars spent on these like BS things that are just like, it's wild. What And they're not FDA do. regulated. They're not regulated. This is, again, very important for your listeners because people will sow fear and confusion because it, it's, it's something that they can profit from. They'll be like, oh, don't trust like the doctors because, you know, blah, 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 blah. But then they're going to sell you something that's not FDA regulated. There's no safety data. There's no effectiveness data. They just made something up in a factory and then they sell it to you with no like safety standards at all. But then they're going to be like, oh, but, you know, don't trust those doctors. And you know, don't trust the FDA because, yeah. you know, they're big government. It's all they're all in bed with big pharma. Right? It's like at a certain point you have to pick. So in, unless you are going to be somebody who does not earn a living um, and has time to do research on every decision of their life mm -hmm. throughout the day, there has got to be a bucket of people that you choose to trust so mm -hmm. that you can go on and be a productive human being. Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, to be fair, there's such a lack of information we've talked about, um, but that unfortunately has led a lot of people to seek help from, you know, very unsafe resources. Right. So, you right. know, like I always and tell part people- part of that comes back yeah. to us. It comes back yeah. to us as healthcare providers. Like yeah. if there was more readily available information like this book of yours, mm -hmm. um, it's not hysteria, mm -hmm. then people wouldn't feel so out of sorts and they'd be turning to essentially peers. Yeah. Peers yeah. who are so, purporting to be experts. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. Can hormonal contraception fix endometriosis and or PCOS? No, it can help to, you know, help with some of the symptoms. So we tell people, does birth control make periods less crampy and painful? And can it help with endometriosis symptoms? It can, but it's not making it go away. So it's not like treating like the root cause, but it can make symptoms feel better. Uh, same thing with PCOS, like the progesterone we mentioned can help to, you know, prevent the overgrowth of tissue, can decrease, you know, some of the bleeding and irregularity. And it can actually also help with some of the acne and facial hair. It decreases 
testosterone. So it does have some benefits, but it's not fixing the actual, like, you know, whatever it was. <laughs> Again, we don't know uh, what the original problem is with the PCOS and the endometriosis. But it's a first step. Like we tell people, you know, oftentimes we're going to try one thing as a first step, but it's not making the actual condition go away. Is there an actual uptick in miscarriages or are my young adult clients hearing more about it on social media because there is social media today? And I think it's more of the latter. Now, the caveat is that during COVID, it did seem like the COVID was increasing miscarriage and stillbirth rates. It seemed to affect like the placenta and, you know, people were also, you know, things having like blood clots in the placenta. So there was an uptick back in the pandemic of things like pregnancy losses at all gestational ages. But in general, I think it is too just the people talking about it. It used to be, and, and some people still treat it this way, that, oh, you don't tell people you're pregnant until you're 14 Ugh. weeks because God forbid you miscarry, you will have to tell people that you miscarried and who wants and that? And then they'll be there for you in your grief right? because in the absence of it, you're alone you? in the fetal position, yeah. rocking back and forth. I mean, I've suffered two miscarriages. I had two miscarriages. I too, yeah. never mm-hmm. forget about those pregnancies. Mm-hmm. Never. Yep. And people, and I talk about this in the miscarriage chapter of the book, that, you know, that culture of silence and, oh, it's just too embarrassing. Why would you share that? It just makes everyone feel alone. And this perpetuates mm-hmm. that idea that, oh my gosh, it must just be me. No one else has miscarriages. I'm the only one. I'm not going to talk about this. It's like, I I say, it's like the emperor's new clothes. Like once you finally talk about it, you realize that so many of your friends and acquaintances had the same experience. You know, miscarriage, fertility issues, period problems, bladder problems, all of these. You know, once you start talking about it, you're like, hey, wait, all of us have gone through this. And we all thought we were the only one because of this culture of silence. And that then leads also to, you know, the lack of research and funding you know, it's, oh, it doesn't really affect anyone. Or if it does, it's just like this overly emotional woman who, you know, why is this a medical problem? It's just something she has to deal with. And and like I said, that's just absolutely untrue and unfair. You know, these are medical experiences. They're emotional human experiences. Like we should you know, obviously feel comfortable talking about them and getting care and validation and support for them. So yeah, like, yeah, like a, a lot of medical professional women have had miscarriages or fertility problems. We put off our own, you know, childbearing because of training and all that right. stuff. So it is a very high rate of miscarriage and infertility among healthcare professionals. And right. Like it's a lot of people sad. hide it because yeah, you're, oh, you can't tell your coworkers I'm having a miscarriage. You know, I didn't tell my coworkers I was having a miscarriage. I just quietly I like either. took a day off, you know, it's just, and now I'm like, of course, if I had to do it again, I'd be like, fucking everybody. I'd be like, guess what's happening right now? I need time off to deal with this. And so we should feel comfortable. Everyone listening, speak out. You know, you you deserve to get people to support you and understand what you're going through. Let us comfort you. Let us comfort you in a loss. Mm -hmm. It is such a big loss. Just circling back to the correlation of catching COVID and an uptick in miscarriages and stillbirths. Mm -hmm. I have to play both sides of the coin. Mm -hmm. Any correlation between the vaccine? Have we backed that out of it to see if it could be vaccine related? Oh, it was before the vaccine was out. So like they were already seeing it. I know. So I was like, and the oh, it's so clean. Not, That's yeah. such a clean answer. Easier. Yeah. And uh, obviously they have not shown with the vaccine, you know, since it's been okay. out any increase. Uh, but it was something that people noticed. They're like, oh, my God, like I, I belong to a bunch of discussion groups with OBGYNs on Facebook. And everyone's like, um, are you all seeing like this uptick in miscarriage? And like, yeah, like there's definitely something noticeable there. Um, so, yeah, it, it was thought to be the actual infection itself affecting placenta does, you know, causing maybe like microscopic clots and and things like that. So thank you so much for that. That was so helpful. Yeah. Is there anything young adult women should be doing today to prepare their bodies for having children in the future? Oh, that's a great question. So one, just knowing about fertility is so important because, you know, a lot of people don't learn about this at all. <laughs> I, I spoke with someone recently about how sex ed is all about like avoiding danger. It's like avoid the infection, avoid the unwanted pregnancy. It's not about like achieving your sexual or fertility goals. <laughs> it's not about like how to preserve your fertility or how to become pregnant when you want to be or how to have a satisfying sex life. It's just like run from danger. So in general, just knowing how your fertility works, knowing that 
you know, women are born with the eggs you're going to have your whole life and that that pool goes down and the quality goes down over time. That's why it's harder to get pregnant or there's more miscarriages when you get older. So, you know, just to be able to help you plan pregnancies in the future, just knowing that um, I've had patients come in when they were like in their early 40s being like, well, I think I might want to try to get pregnant maybe in like two years or so. And I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, if fertility is important to you, like now is the time, like, you know, yes. your, your fertility diem. rate. Yeah, carpe diem. Um, and also things like uh, egg freezing to know that if you need to delay childbearing for a long time because of your job, before you know, career or training, a lot of places now um, employers will have access to egg freezing, uh, fertility options. So just knowing what your options are uh, is so great for being able to empower you to take control of that. And then also just generally just being healthy, just, you know, like eating well, exercising, just obviously all the things that you would do normally to care for your body, to keep yourself healthy as possible. And it's not about like losing weight or being a certain weight. It's about health. And, you know, that's important for preventing things like um, gestational diabetes, preeclampsia, that sort of thing. And also, you know, we mentioned um, that there are some things that are associated with being obese or overweight. It can make it difficult to ovulate. It can affect ovulation and fertility. So there are some aspects of that where, again, it's not about achieving a certain weight loss. It's about being as healthy as you possibly can be. That's great. That is so important. And, you know, this is not part of the lightning round, but I do want to mention this because I saw this when I read your book. Not only did I see it, I screenshotted it and shared it with at least four clients Amazing. who had had pregnancy scares that month when I was reading the book. I, I, am I correct in recalling the statistic that the pullout method is about as effective as no birth control whatsoever, folks? Yeah, basically. And so it's basically like a uh, like 20 to 30 percent failure, which is not that far off from doing absolutely nothing. Uh, the reason it fails so much is a couple of things. One is you can have pre-cum or pre-ejaculate that you know, is there before the man isn't ejaculates. That the, the isn't sperm. that just the natural way that the male body lubricates the female body so the penis can enter the vagina? I'm a lesbian, folks, and I am just connecting dots left and right. Like, <laughs> like this is Anna, this is how we're designed. They yeah, are meant to have pre ejaculation. Right. Yeah. It, it, it's going to have some sperm and, and guess some fluid what happens? There. It's yeah. going to have some live sperm in it. There you go. And it can get you pregnant. And then also because the control of this is not at all in the woman's like ball court, so to speak. So it all depends on the partner with the penis being able to pull out in time before any ejaculate. I mean, so it just has a very, very high failure rate. And so we tell people that, you know, if a couple, it, it, when you look at couples who are using withdrawal as a method that, you know, you will have at least one of five couples is going to be pregnant by the end of the year. It's just a huge percent. So if you are wanting to absolutely prevent pregnancy. Do not make that your only method of contraception. It is just a very high failure risk. And to underscore how bad that stat is or how likely you are to get pregnant, mm -hmm. I'm just going to say that when you're trying to get pregnant, mm -hmm. if you can't get pregnant right away and you go to your doctor, correct me if this stat is wrong. I'm working mm -hmm. off of a 12-year memory here of the last time I tried to get pregnant. Um, you go to your doctor and your doctor's like, how long have you been trying? And you're like two or three months. Doctor's like, come back to me after six months. Average American person takes mm -hmm. six months to get pregnant when you're trying. You're trying. <laughs> yes, right. Exactly. So yes. I want you to understand that it takes the average person six months to get pregnant when they're trying. Mm -hmm. And with the pullout method or the withdrawal method, mm -hmm. is that what we're yeah. calling it these yeah, days? Yeah, yeah. The mm -hmm. withdrawal method, you're one in six are going to get pregnant inside of a year. Is that what you one said? One in five. <laughs> yeah, one in oh, five. Oh, even better. <laughs> I know. And and it can take like a normal healthy couple up to a year to get pregnant. And like I said, of that's course. when you are trying to get pregnant. And so it is really not super far off when you're, you know, like, like we, it, it's a joke, but it's not a joke. It, it's that, you know, w when someone is not preventing pregnancy, they're basically trying. Like, you know, if you're not doing something super effective to prevent the pregnancy from happening, it's like equivalent to trying actively to get pregnant. Uh, literally. Because, yeah, yeah. Literally. So so let's just not live in denial, kids. Yeah. Let's not sure. live in denial. If we're not using contraception and we're having unprotected sex, mm -hmm. we are trying to get pregnant. Yeah. 
basically. <laughs> Whenever I post about withdrawal on social media, there's many comments and I love that people do this. Like they basically claim it. They're like, look, I was trying, I use withdrawal and my withdrawal baby is seven now. And they li literally, you'll see all I of love these comments. That. Like my withdrawal baby's 12. And like I said, I, they're, they're not embarrassed to say it because it happened and, and this happens. It's not that, you know, people like are foolish, like it, but it is just, no, I got pregnant. I got pregnant that yeah. way. Yeah, you it's know? important to know exactly just yeah. for people to realize. I think people don't realize it's as as high a pregnancy rate as it is. And so that's why you get all these people who are like, yep, it happened to me. It just for any listeners who are confused, because I used to be married to a man and dated men before that, just mm -hmm. to clarify any ambiguity there that I might have created. My listeners know my deal. Um, the last question, and I love this. Do you have any resources or messages of hope to women struggling with endo or chronic pain related to their reproductive organs? Yes. And I love ending on a positive message because so many times like these conversations are so like doom and gloom, like, oh, like the state of the world and women's health is so bad. But there is hope. And I love doing this because when I see patients in the office, when they finally hear, they're like, oh, my gosh, there is some hope here. And like, you know, they're crying because they're just overwhelmed with they've been going through this for so long and like searching for help. And there is help. So, you know, between like excision surgery, those of you who have endometriosis know this, you know, expert excision surgery removing the endometriosis, really highly effective. And then when you pair it with other stuff we have to offer, pelvic physical therapy, other management of muscle pain, bowel issues, bladder issues, um, it takes a lot. It's not just doing surgery, just giving birth control. You have to have a whole team approach. And, you know, but with all of that, you have like a really good chance of living a very good quality of life and sometimes even getting rid of everything altogether in terms of pain. So I tell people, it's like, you just have to get on the train tracks. Like my analogy is you have to get on the train tracks. We're going to start like pushing you down the rails. It's not going to be the end of the destination right at the beginning, but we're going to get you there. And that is the exciting part is that once you kind of get on that train track, we're going to keep on rolling until you finally, you know, get to where you need to be. And that's for everything. It's not just endo, menopause, PCOS, PMDD, all of that. You just have to kind of, you know, get that healthcare provider who understands you, knows what they're doing, can offer the treatments, believes you. You know, the whole, it's not hysteria, you know, understands that these are actual issues and not just in your mind. It's so important. It's so exciting. And that's, like I said, you know, leaving everybody with that message of hope that that hope is out there. Gosh, Dr. Cheer. Karen Kang, yeah. <laughs> literally, it is, it is no surprise to me that you've become a rock star on, on TikTok. Oh I, I love your energy. I love your answers. You are rooted in science. You are so legitimate. And your message of hope is really, really inspiring. Once again, the name of the book is It's Not Hysteria. And I will link to that in the show notes. Dr. Karen Tang, thank you so much for being here. I'm so grateful. Oh my gosh, it was an amazing conversation. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. We Need to Talk with Dr. Darcy Sterling is a Sterling Standard production. Editing and sound engineering is by Bart Migal. Our theme music is by Trending Music. Special thanks to Amanda Cristiani, Stephanie Sterling, and Preston Smith. Please share this episode with someone you love. We will be back on Tuesday with another episode packed with the relationship, dating, and mental health hacks you've come to expect. See you then.